So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, uh, and welcome to the Matrix Online Seminar. Uh, today we're very pleased to have Emily Rio uh, speaking about elements of infinity category theory. Uh, Emily uh, did a PhD at the uh, University of Chicago, spent a few years at Harvard, and is now at Johns Hopkins as an associate uh, professor. Um, we regard Emily as a half Australian because she's very much into Australian rules football, uh, playing in the International Cup. Um, so she's one of us. Um, very much looking forward to the talk. Uh, as usual, we'll do the questions at the end of the seminar. You can enter questions through the Q&A session at the bottom of your screen. So don't use the chat, but the Q&A, and we'll go through all your questions one by one after, after the talk. I'm going to hand over to Emily now. Um, enjoy the talk. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, very honored to be considered as a half Australian. Uh, um, in fact, uh, this project, I guess, by that measure, would, would be more than half Australian because it's everything is joint work with uh, Dominic Verity from Macquarie University in Sydney. And um, in fact, it really is an honor to have an opportunity to speak about this in Australia because uh, Australia plays a very important role in this project. So infinity categories were first defined by uh, Rainer Vort and um, Michael Boardman, so a German and a Brit. And then the theory of infinity categories was developed by Andre Joyal, a French Canadian, and then Jacob Lurie from the United States. Um, so in particular, kind of the early history of infinite dimensional category theory is very Northern hemisphere centered. Um, but if I were to describe, you know, kind of the main thrust of this project or what's uh, original about our joint work is that we're applying what is called Australian style formal category theory to the development of infinity category theory. So um, what Australian style formal category theory refers to is a very particular expertise in category theory that is centered in Sydney. Um, Macquarie University in Sydney is widely considered to be the best uh, category theory group in the world, um, not just because it has this, this wealth of fabulous researchers, uh, Steve Lack, Richard Garner, Ross Street, produced fantastic PhD students, uh, mentored a lot of postdocs, um, but more so than all of that, uh, they have this particular depth of perspective on what category theory is that's not widely known elsewhere in the world. So when I was a PhD student, I made my first pilgrimage to Sydney to spend some time at Macquarie and try and learn some of the perspectives that have been developed there. And I'm, I'm not alone. It's a very common practice for category theorists to come to Sydney to uh, learn from the group at Macquarie. Um, so I had meant to uh, mention all of this anyway as a, a way to celebrate the local expertise and celebrate my colleagues, but um, it's kind of particularly poignant now because as many of you might know, uh, Macquarie, like many other universities around the world, is really struggling financially due to the pandemic. And uh, in particular, their uh, strategy of responding to these financial difficulties has been to terminate large proportions of faculty positions in many different disciplines across the university, but in mathematics in particular. And, um, you know, I find this particularly distressing because it occurs to me that if cuts of this nature happened five or 10 years ago, I don't think this work would have ever taken place. I don't think these theorems could have been proven without the group at Macquarie University. Um, and uh, I guess with that in mind, I also want to really acknowledge the role that has been played in this project by my collaborator, Dom. Uh, it was his idea originally that um, Australian style formal category theory might be powerful enough to prove theorems about infinity categories. And to the experts, this is really, really surprising because somehow we're taking infinite dimensions and truncating to finite dimensions while retaining enough information. And uh, it was really a beautiful idea. And um, I'm thrilled to have been a part of this project. Um, Dom, in addition to being a brilliant mathematician, is a wonderful teacher and uh, sort of a superlative university citizen. He was the president of their, or the chair of their faculty senate for many years at Macquarie. And so I want to take the opportunity this uh, public forum to sing his praises because I know um, 
you know, we can't quite predict what's going to happen in the future, but um, many of his colleagues, perhaps Don himself, will be looking for a job and any university would be really lucky to have him. Okay, so with that out of the way, let me dive into the mathematics. So um, if you're in certain areas of mathematics, maybe algebraic topology, algebraic geometry, mathematical physics, you might have noticed that infinity categories pop up in papers or in talks in your field. And typically how they appear is something like this. The headline theorem will be, you know, kind of the standard theorem in mathematics. Something is equivalent to some other thing. And jets correspond to n excisive functors. But then when you read the fine print, when you see how that theorem is, the sort of slogan is made precise and then formally stated and proven, uh, it's uh, often implemented as an equivalence of infinity categories. So it's sort of natural to wonder if you're a working mathematician in these areas, sort of what are these infinity categories all about? What are they here for? What are they doing in uh, my theorems? Um, so uh, before I go on, I should clarify uh, the term I'm using infinity category as a nickname for what is more properly called an infinity one category. And that itself is a special case of a more general notion of infinite dimensional category called an infinity n category. But what these refer to is they are uh, categories. Um, so we have mathematical objects and morphisms between them and we have morphisms in all dimensions. That's the infinity. Um, these are weak categories. And then the index n is indicating that above some dimension, all the morphisms are weakly invertible. This is a flavor of infinite dimensional category that comes up in practice. But for this talk, I will uh, stick with sort of the simplest kind of infinite dimensional categories, which are these infinity one categories with objects and um, morphisms and then weakly invertible morphisms above the usual dimension. So I should explain sort of what these infinity categories are and what they're for. And to introduce the idea, there's this lovely metaphor of Barry Mazur um, written in an essay that was a tribute to Saunders McLean. He describes ordinary categories, ordinary one-dimensional categories as something that frame a possible template for any mathematical theory. The theory should have nouns and verbs, in other words, objects and morphisms. And there should be an explicit notion of composition relating to these morphisms. The theory should, in brief, be packaged by a category. So what Barry means by this is, uh, you know, in the history of mathematics, there was this idea that the abstract theory of symmetry could be uh, codified into the definition of a group. Um, and then Emmy Nuther and her school had the idea that to productively study the theory of groups, we should also consider group homomorphisms. So groups are the objects and group homomorphisms are the transformations between them. So uh, her point of view is that groups sh should be studied as objects in the category of groups. But as the objects that mathematicians study become more sophisticated, uh, the template for their theory might require, in addition to nouns and verbs, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns, prepositions, conjunctions, interjections. So in other words, a finer morphism as opposed to the structure preserving homomorphisms. And so that's the idea of an infinity category. It's something that has objects you can think about as maybe uh, topological groups and morphisms between them, the order, which we're now going to call morphisms in dimension one. These are the ordinary morphisms. Um, so in addition to a higher dimensional structure in an infinity category, there's also a weakening. In an ordinary category, composition is a binary operation. If you have a morphism from G to H and from H to K, then there's a composite morphism from G to K. In an infinity category, uh, composition composites exist, but not uniquely. So the composite of two one morphisms is witnessed somehow by an invertible two morphism. So for each composite, there will be a witnessing two morphism witnessing the composition relation. And then associativity is not an equation anymore, but rather a coherence condition between witnesses. So um, here I've drawn three composable one morphisms, F, G, and H, uh, some specified composites, which are witnessed by these two morphisms, alpha, beta, and gamma. And really there should be a fourth two morphism on the back of this tetrahedron. And then a three morphism would inhabit that three dimensional space witnessing a coherence condition between these uh, two dimensional morphisms. And this continues all the way up. Um, so this is the idea of an infinity category. Now it's natural to ask why we are weakening the category structure in addition to adding these higher dimensional morphisms. And the reason is that's because that's how the examples come. So 
uh, a prototypical example of an infinity category. This one happens to be an infinity groupoid, meaning all of its morphisms are invertible, is um, something called the fundamental infinity groupoid. And it's an infinity category whose objects are, so we fix a topological space. Uh, here I've drawn a surface of genus three, but pick your favorite. Uh, the objects of the fundamental infinity groupoid are the points of that space. The one morphisms are the paths of that space. The two morphisms are the homotopies between these paths. The three morphisms are homotopies between those homotopies, and then we can have higher homotopies all the way up. So there are morphisms in all dimensions. And uh, you'll note in contrast with uh, the fundamental group, um, because the one morphisms are paths rather than homotopy classes of paths, uh, composition is no longer a sort of strictly well-defined binary associative operation. Instead, uh, we interpret a homotopy as witnessing that some path is a composite of some other paths, exactly as suggested on the previous slide. Now, this infinity category, like all infinity categories, will have a quotient that is an ordinary category. The quotient is sometimes called the homotopy category of the infinity category. And in this case, it recovers the fundamental one groupoid. So this is something that's equivalent to the fundamental group if your space is path connected. So um, we can think of this as an enhancement of a more classical invariant of a space, but it's also a better invariant of a space. So the fundamental one groupoid only captures the one type of the topological space where the fundamental infinity groupoid captures the full homotopy type. And uh, there are other examples in other areas of mathematics. So uh, in algebraic geometry, there's something called the derived category of a ring. Um, and this is itself a homotopy category of an infinity category, the infinity category of chain complexes. So objects are chain more complexes, then we have the uh, ordinary morphisms, the chain morphisms, but then also chain homotopies and degree two and degree three and all these higher maps are naturally packaged into the structure of the infinity category of chain complexes. And some features that you might be familiar with in the derived category, namely that it's triangulated, are more naturally expressed as properties of the infinity category. So this is another case where uh, there's an improvement in moving from the quotient homotopy category to the real infinity category. And a final example comes up in the context of topological quantum field theories. Um, they were originally defined by ITEA using a category of closed N manifolds and diffeomorphism classes of cobordisms between them. But now that's understood as a homotopy category of an infinity category where you allow the cobordisms themselves to be the one morphisms and then the diffeomorphisms are two morphisms and you can add isotopies on top of that and go all the way up. Okay, so that's giving some sense of what infinity categories are, where they come up in mathematics. But if you're an outsider again, and I'm hoping the target audience of this talk are people to whom this theory is new, there are some curiosities. If you've, uh, th there's some curiosities, I guess, in the way that uh, mathematicians interact with infinity categories. So one curiosity, um, you know, there've been a variety of introductory lectures that um, explain the sort of motivations and the concepts of infinity categories. And a, a beautiful one that I want to call attention to is uh, Carlos Simpson's uh, three-hour lecture series at MSRI in 2019, entitled Infinity Categories and Why They Are Useful. And they're really lovely talks. They're online, so you're um, welcome to look at them, particularly if you're coming from an algebraic geometry background. Um, but what's curious about his lecture series is it purports to teach the audience about infinity categories, but he doesn't actually give a definition of infinity categories until the second hour, the, sort of the second half of the second talk, so about halfway through. Another curiosity is if you look at the definition that uh, Carlos gives in his introductory lecture series, um, so that also appears in a paper of his with Andre Hirschewitz, um, it's not the same definition that's used elsewhere in the literature. So. Um, a paper of uh, Pedro Bovita de Brito and Michael Weiss uses a different definition. This paper of Blumberg, Gebner, Tabuata uses a third definition, and still another definition appears in higher topos theory at various points. Um, so I should explain that. Uh, the, I guess part of the issue is that it's hard to define exactly what an infinity category is. I sketched a definition uh, on a previous slide by saying it has morphisms and some sort of weak composition witnessed by higher morphisms. The thing is, it's, it's difficult to give a precise instantiation of a weak composition law. That's not something that's easily expressed in the axioms of set theory. Um, so um, 
I mean, of course, if we're doing rigorous mathematics, it, the community consensus is you should define your mathematical objects in set theory. And what uh, experts refer to as models of infinity categories are particular sort of Bourbaki style mathematical objects um, that capture the idea of an infinite dimensional category with a weak composition law. So what I'm referring to in these four papers are four different models of infinity categories that go by the name of Siegel categories and complete Siegel spaces and quasi categories and uh, marked simplicial sets. Okay. So a third curiosity is uh, we have the idea now that to give a rigorous definition of an infinity category, we need to use one of these models. And so it would follow then to develop rigorously the theory of infinity categories, that is to extend theorems from ordinary category theory to infinity categories, we would have to use a model because if, you know, if we're not starting from a rigorous definition, we're, you're kind of in trouble at the start. And so um, famously, Andre Joyal pioneered and then Jacob Lurie con continued this uh, rigorous development of the theory of infinity categories modeled as quasi categories. But uh, you know, some of the examples of infinity categories come more naturally in other models. So there's been an industry where researchers, here's uh, one example, take a theorem that has been proven using one model of infinity categories and reprove it using another model. Um, you know, there's, it's, that's certainly a reasonable thing to do. Uh, you know, these theorems, uh, in this case, it's a, about the Yoneda lemma, um, which involves something called Cartesian vibrations. If you look up the definition of Cartesian vibration in quasi-categories in one of the models, it involves particular features of that model, the, sort of the language in which that definition is written refers to the kind of combinatorial coordinates of that model. So it, it, since it's difficult in many cases to translate a definition from one model to another, uh, then certainly a proof built on that definition would have to be redeveloped in a, another setting. So, so this has been a common practice for um, people working on the foundations of infinity category theory is to take theorems proven in one model and reprove them in another model. Um, but all, at the same time, all the experts have a sense that the model should really be beside the point. The infinity categories, it's itself the fundamental notion. These models are just sort of scaffolding that help us work with infinity categories and help us access them. And so famously, uh, Jacob Lurie, who's um, one of the towering figures in the area, uh, you know, wrote uh, a foundational textbook called Higher Topos Theory, but um, a previous version of it, which is available on the archive, this preprint on infinity Topoi um, avoids selecting a model of infinity categories at all. So Jacob wrote, we'll begin in section one with an informal review of the theory of infinity categories. You know, this is sort of typical <laughs> modesty. Um, there are many approaches to the foundations of the subject, each having its own particular merits and demerits. Rather than seek out one of those foundations here, well, we shall attempt to explain the ideas involved and how to work with them. The hope is that this will render this paper readable to a wider audience, while experts will be able to fill in the details missing from our exposition in whatever framework they happen to prefer. So what I'm trying to point out here is that uh, the um, researchers working in the foundations of infinity category theory have all along desired to do away with the models and would prefer to just develop the theory in a model independent fashion. Now, my understanding of the history is that early readers of this paper sort of pushed back and said, you know, <laughs> essentially we don't feel like there are enough experts in the mathematical community to fill in the details missing from the exposition. And so they, the community forced um, Jacob Lurie to choose a model and then he wrote higher topos theory using the quasi categories model. But um, everyone has always felt this kind of deep desire to work with infinity categories model independently. And um, that's really the main theme of our contribution. So uh, this talk I'm hoping is an advertisement for a book that should appear sometime later this year. It's called Elements of Infinity Category Theory, and there's a full version available online. And what uh, Dom and I have discovered is that it is, in fact, possible to rigorously develop not all, but a large portion of the theory of infinity categories in a model independent fashion. So we will introduce, you know, sort of the building blocks of infinity category theory, adjunctions, limits and co-limits, Cartesian vibrations, uh, con extensions, and so on. 
um, but in definitions that can be interpreted simultaneously in any of the models. And we will prove theorems in category theory, theorems in formal category theory, if you will, in such a way that those proofs immediately interpret in the models. So the way we do this is we apply the philosophy of category theory to the development of category theory. The philosophy of category theory says if you're interested in studying some sort of mathematical object, you should think about the category in which it lives as an object. And so that's exactly what we do. We think about, I mean, an infinity category is, of course, a very big thing. It has its own objects and then infinitely many morphisms. But we sort of zoom out and think of it as being a very small thing, as an object itself in a much larger <laughs> infinite dimensional category of all the other infinity categories. And um, we refer to this category where the infinity categories live as objects as an infinity cosmos. And what we observe is that for each of the different models of infinity categories, uh, their infinity cosmoi, so the infinity cosmos of quasi-categories, the infinity cosmos of complete Siegel spaces, the infinity cosmos of Siegel categories, they have common features. And we define an, an infinity cosmos to be axiomatically, to be a sort of a short enumeration of some of the common features of these categories in which infinity categories live as objects and then prove our theorems starting from those axioms. So on the one hand, uh, this allows us to treat infinity categories sort of synthetically just as objects in some category with certain features and then prove theorems in this very general way that will specialize to all of the particular models. It's completely blind to which model we're using in. It also lets us uh, kind of rigorously treat the question of change of model and the question of model independence. So um, from our framework, it's kind of transparently obvious that a synthetic proof of a theorem in infinity category theory uh, translates between models. But very importantly, there are proofs that we consider analytic that are you know, proven by our colleagues using the combinatorics of a particular model. And we can take, in that case, not the proof, but the conclusion of the theorem and uh, translate it in between models. Um, that's the sort of the uh, a key point of our model independence theorem. And that theorem is actually uh, more subtle than, you know, perhaps this advertisement is suggesting because um, in fact, not every statement about even ordinary uh, categories is invariant under equivalence of categories. And for that reason, not every statement about infinity categories could necessarily be invariant under change of model. There are sort of so-called evil statements that don't respect equivalence of infinity categories that will never be model independent. Um, but we're able to um, build on work of Michael Mackay and introduce a formal language for expressing properties of infinity categories that are independent of a choice of model. So um, those are the takeaways. And what I'm going to do with the rest of this time is um, give you a taste of what this looks like. So I'll start by illustrating a little bit of Australian style formal category theory um, to, to um, prove or to describe one of the sort of theorems that we prove that can be proven in a cl classical category theory and then extended to infinity category theory. Um, I'll explain a little bit about how the model independent foundations work and uh, time permitting, I'll also discuss model independence. Okay, so what is category theory all about? Um, I mean, in a one sense, uh, category theory is about giving very general proofs about uh, theorems concerning mathematical objects. So here's a theorem uh, for natural numbers a, b, and c. Uh, a times b plus c is a times b plus a times c, distributivity of multiplication over addition. So there are many, many proofs of this, but I'm going to present a categorical one. So um, firstly, we can uh, categorify the statement. We can choose sets. A, B, and C, whose cardinalities, whose number of elements are the natural numbers A, B, and C. And then I'm going to exhibit, to prove that A times B plus C is equal to A times B plus A times C, I'm going to exhibit an isomorphism or a bijection between sets, where on the left I've written the Cartesian product of the set A with the disjoint union of B plus C. That's a set with A times B plus C many elements. And then on the right I have written the disjoint union of the Cartesian product of A with B and A with C. So if I exhibit an isomorphism like this, then I can take cardinality, I can decategorify, and then uh, conclude the theorem about uh, natural numbers. 
Okay, and there's a particular way that I'm going to exhibit an isomorphism. I mean, there is a, a sort of natural isomorphism between these objects that you might have in mind, but um, another strategy for exhibiting an isomorphism between two objects of one category, in this case, between these two sets, is to apply something called the Yaneda lemma. This is really the fundamental theorem of category theory. And the Yaneda lemma says that to show that uh, the object A times B plus C is isomorphic to the object A times B plus A times C. Uh, it suffices instead to define a natural bijection between functions from the Cartesian product of A with the disjoint union of B and C to X and functions from the disjoint union of the Cartesian product of A with B and A with C to X. If I had a bijection between functions of this form, um, which is natural, which is a technical term in category theory, then I could consider the identity functions and pass them across the bijection and that would construct an explicit isomorphism between these sets. Okay, and so now I'm going to construct, I've reduced the problem of proving the distributivity of multiplication over addition to this problem of constructing a natural bijection between uh, sets of functions, but um, now there's a standard way to do it and uh, this is secretly a proof of a theorem in category theory that left adjoints preserve co-limits. So if I'm given a function whose domain is the Cartesian product of A with the disjoint union B plus C and whose codomain is X, then uh, by currying, I can think of that as a function whose domain is the disjoint union of B and C and whose codomain is the set of functions from A to X. Now, if I have a function out of a disjoint union of two sets B and C, that's equally, that's in bijection with the data of a pair of functions, so one, from B into the set of functions from A to the X, and one from C to the set of functions from A to X. And then I could uncurry those two component functions, and now I have two functions, one from the Cartesian product of A and B into X, and one from the Cartesian product of A and C into X. And then I could pair those back together to get a single function out of the disjoint union of the Cartesian product of A with B and A with C into X, and that sequence of operations, uh, currying, pairing, uncurring, repairing uh, is a construction of this required bijection. Okay, so the reason I like that particular proof is that that same argument, not so much the first part about the categorification, but the second part about uh, currying and pairing and so on, um, can be understood as a, a very general proof of a very general theorem and category theory called left adjoints preserve co-limits. So um, the steps were something called transposing across and a junction, a junction being a, a pair of functors between two different categories that express some sort of duality between maps in one category and maps in a different category. And then universal property of the co-limits that was sort of breaking up a function out of a disjoint union into its two component functions. So um, other theorems that one encounters in one's mathematical education is that there's a linear isomorphism between uh, U tensor V direct sum W for vector spaces and the direct sum of U tensor V and U tensor W. Um, you also learn that the free group on a disjoint union of sets is the free product of the free groups on those two sets, or that uh, tensor product with the bimodule is right exact, or that for any uh, function between sets, the inverse image preserves both unions and intersections while the direct image preserves unions. These are all instances of this theorem that left adjoints preserve co-limits. Um, though secretly the last one, um, the reason that the inverse image is sort of a better behaved construction in mathematics, that it respects both unions and intersections and not just unions is because the inverse image is, is both a left and right adjoint where the direct image is only a left adjoint, it is not also a right adjoint. And What's going on secretly in this kind of left versus right business is um, a fun fact about categories is there is an axiomatic duality. If you um, have any category, you can construct another category by formally turning around the direction of the arrows and uh, also reversing the order of composition. And that structure will again satisfy the axioms that define a category. And so what that means is that if you have any theorem about categories, you get at least one dual theorem for free. The same proof can be interpreted as proving a different conclusion. So this theorem that left adjoints preserve colimits and the proof that left adjoints preserve colimits also demonstrates that right adjoints preserve 
limits. So um, left adjoints are these free constructions, right adjoints are often kind of underlying constructions, forgetful constructions, those behave well with uh, inverse limits where left adjoints behave well with direct limits. Okay, so now I want to illustrate a little bit of what this same theorem, uh, right adjoints preserve limits, I'm gonna dualize going forward, looks like in Australian style formal category theory. And uh, this will be a bit mystifying if this is the first time you see it, but uh, some of your, uh, some of your contemporaries um, know this language very well, and so I want to speak to them. Um, so I, I should define an adjunction, which is this uh, kind of central concept. And actually the definition I'm going to give of an adjunction is not um, the most common one, but is uh, you could ask one of these category theorists in Sydney and they would be able to explain to you how it connects to the common ones. So an adjunction is given by a pair of categories. You can think of A as being some categories with some algebraic structure, and maybe B is the base category on which those algebras, in which those algebras are formed. We have a pair of functors. U is like an underlying set functor. F is a free functor. And then the further data of an adjunction is a natural transformation. So this is a two-dimensional morphism between categories, and it's depicted by drawing a two-dimensional arrow in a uh, region that's bounded by one-dimensional arrows. And a way to say that this two-dimensional arrow, this map epsilon, is uh, defines an adjunction with F the left adjoint and U the right adjoint is to say that this triangle is what's called absolute right lifting. So this is a dual uh, to a uh, sort of up dual to the notion of absolute right con extension, which might be a little bit more familiar. Um, what that universal property asserts is a bijection between natural transformations. So um, composing with epsilon in a particular way, pasting with epsilon, implements a bijection between natural transformations alpha from uh, f of b to a and natural transformations beta from b to u of a. So this is the sort of usual transposing operation for an adjunction, but expressed using generalized elements as opposed to just ordinary uh, transposition of arrows between objects. Okay, but the point is there's a uh, sort of a formal categorical context. It's uh, something called a two category um, with uh, objects and arrows and two arrows um, in which you can define this notion of an adjunction. And the reason I've chosen to express an adjunction using absolute lifting diagrams is that one can define limits in a very similar way. So a limit is uh, something that's constructed given a diagram. So um, a diagram is just another name for a functor. So if we have a diagram from a category J to a category A, the data of a limit involves an object in the category A, which I'm representing by a functor, little l, whose uh, domain is the category with a single object. So a functor out of it just picks out an object in the category it's mapping into. And then the limit cone is a uh, natural transformation from the constant functor at L um, to the diagram D. So this lambda is the limit cone from the constant J-shaped functor at the object L to the diagram D. And to say that this data is absolute right lifting, the same uh, universal property as depicted in the pacing diagram on the left, uh, expresses exactly the universal property of limits, that composition with the limit cone implements a bijection between arrows with codomain L and uh, cones with some arbitrary summit over the diagram. Okay. So the advantage to uh, encoding adjunctions and limits in this sort of formal way is now there's a very slick proof that right adjoints preserve limits that is like the proof that we saw uh, a few slides ago. So we have, there's a transposing step and then a universal property step and then a transposing step and then a universal property step, but it's somehow even slicker than that. Um, so, uh, the statement says that if I'm given a limit cone, this lambda in A, and a right adjoint functor U, when I uh, compose U with the limit cone, I get a natural transformation in this triangle shape here, and we need to prove that that is absolute right lifting. Um, but there's this uh, calculus of pasting diagrams, and um, 
it follows immediately from the universal property of absolute right lifting diagrams that they can be composed vertically and canceled on the bottom. So to show that this top diagram is absolute right lifting is equivalent to show that this left diagram where I paste, paste it on with the co-unit of the adjunction is absolute right lifting um, by some two naturality of uh, the kind of Cartesian closed structure on cat. Um, this is equal to the central diagram and then equal to the right hand diagram, which is a vertical composite of two absolute right lifting diagrams and therefore is absolute right lifting. So um, this is a proof uh, of the sort of classical theorem and ordinary category theory that right adjoints preserve limits. Okay, so um, this is something that uh, can be understood uh, by the classical category theory community. And what's really surprising uh, to people working in this sort of homotopically inflected infinite dimensional category theory is that this very same argument, exactly the one that I've just presented that's working in some strict two category proves the corresponding theorem for infinity categories. Um, so um, even though infinity categories have sort of infinite dimensions of coherence data and it's very complicated definition and sort of spread between models, this proof that I've given here is the proof that right adjoints between infinity categories preserve infinity categorical limits. And what I'd like to do now is explain how that is going to work. So, uh, what infinity category means if we're working rigorously and not just speaking heuristically, uh, it's something that's made precise by several models that are construct connected by change of model functors. So in this diagram, I've given names for some of the most common models. Um, so uh, one way to model an infinity category is as a category enriched over topological spaces or as something called a relative category. These are the simplest models to define, um, but they're, uh, not as uh, robust. Um, sort of an issue between them is that the natural notion of maps between infinity categories defined in these models are too strict to model all infinity functors. Uh, so the well-behaved models and the only ones that I'm going to refer to in the remainder of this talk are these remaining four. So quasi-categories, complete Siegel spaces, maybe we'll call them Resk spaces in honor of Charles Resk, uh, Siegel categories, and uh, something that I like to call one complicial set, saturated one trivial weak complicial sets. These are some sort of marked simplicial sets. So these are four popular models that appear widely in the literature. And uh, they're better behaved in the sense that if we just think about the objects and morphisms in these categories, they correctly model all infinity categories and infinity functors between them. So if we're asking how to develop the category theory of infinity categories, there are two strategies. I like to use this metaphor analytic versus synthetic. So the traditional strategy is the analytic one. So to define what it means to have an adjunction between infinity categories or a limit in an infinity category, um, you can give the definitions and prove the theorems using the combinatorics of one particular model. So for instance, the first definition of limit in infinity category due to Andre Joyal um, is in the quasi category model and refers to simplices and um, simplex boundaries, which are the coordinates of that model. But another strategy is to work synthetically. So um, work from the perspective of the full category of all quasi categories, as opposed to from the perspective of a single quasi category and give definitions and proof theorems in all of these models at once, and that is our method. So an infinity cosmos is an axiomatization of common features of the categories of quasi-categories and resk spaces and Siegel categories and one completional sets. These are the categories whose objects are infinity categories in a particular model. Okay, so to a certain audience, I could give uh, the definition of an infinity cosmos uh, quite easily. It's the axiomatics, are, I mean, it's a new axiomatization, but the precise axioms are not unfamiliar in uh, sort of categorical homotopy theory. So informally, what an infinity cosmos is, is it's an infinite dimensional category. It's an infinity two category with objects, morphisms, and two morphisms, and then invertible things above that with certain infinity two categorical limits. Now, it would be uh, circular to try and develop the theory of 
weak infinite dimensional categories by assuming a theory of weak infinite dimensional categories uh, to just find an infinity cosmos. So this uh, sort of moral notion of infinity cosmos isn't the precise definition. Instead, we use a interpretation of that phrase that is kind of unreasonably strict, sort of much more strict than you would have any reason to hope um, would come up in practice, but uh, it's there are many, many, many examples of infinity two categories with infinity two categorical limits that are very rigid somehow. So we define an infinity cosmos to be a category, firstly, so its objects are the infinity categories and its morphisms are the infinity functors. That category then needs to be enriched over simplicial sets, and in fact, we ask the Hom spaces to be quasi-categories, that's what makes it an infinity two category. And uh, then we have additional structures that allow us to work with this, these sort of flexible infinity two categorical limits in a strict way that will be familiar um, to people who are uh, well-versed in categorical homotopy theory. So for everyone else, <laughs> what's important to note is that all of the models that I've been emphasizing are examples. And um, there are many other things that are examples besides this. So infinity cosmos is not at all an axiomatization of a category of infinity one categories. There are higher dimensional infinity categories that are also infinity categories in some infinity cosmos and also more exotic things, stable infinity categories can be understood as objects in an infinity cosmos, Cartesian vibrations and so on and so forth. So it's meant to be an axiomatization that lets us prove theorems as opposed to an axiomatization that characterizes a particular sort of thing. And uh, the good news, in fact, is that we can make pretty light use of that axiomatization, at least when we're getting started. So there is a quotient of an infinity cosmos that is an ordinary two-dimensional category. So the sort of classical thing that uh, has been studied in Sydney, uh, the objects of this two category are infinity categories in whatever model we're working in. The morphisms are the infinity functors in that model. And the two cells we then call infinity natural transformations. And this uh, quotient two category is somehow homotopically correct. So each model comes with a notion of equivalence between infinity categories. And that's precisely captured by the standard two categorical notion of equivalence. So if you work in the two category and give a definition of that's an equivalence invariant definition. Um, it will be a homotopically correct definition from the point of view of the infinity cosmos that is uh, quotiented away. And this is how the, the proof that I've demonstrated already um, is going to be a proof that right adjoints preserve limits in infinity categories. So surprisingly, adjunctions between infinity categories and limits in an infinity category can be defined in the homotopy two category in exactly the way I presented the classical definitions. So an adjunction is an absolute right lifting diagram of the top form, a limit is an absolute right lifting diagram of the second form, and the proof that right adjoints preserve limits or the dual that left adjoints preserve colimits is the one that I gave above. Now this is very, very surprising to the experts, to folks who are familiar with the traditional proofs in the infinity category literature. So it's essential to ask or to sort of acknowledge where, where all the hard work went. Um, and what's difficult is to prove that these synthetic definitions of a junction and limit uh, coincide with the previously established ones. So um, Joyal's definition of limit is evidently the correct one. Uh, Lurie's definition of a junction is well established now, is, is, is known to be the correct one. So the hard work is in proving that these sort of simple synthetic definitions precisely capture the classical analytic ones in a particular example. We've done that, so um, you can trust us now that these definitions are correct, but that's where the work is packaged in kind of compiling out the synthetic notions in a particular model and seeing what they amount to. Um, but I think that's kind of a nice place for the work to be. Okay, so um, I'll very briefly say something about model independence and then wrap it up. So, um, a nice thing about infinity cosmology is it gives us a framework with, in which to study a uh, change of model functors. So we have certain uh, structure preserving functors between infinity cosmoi that we call cosmological bi-equivalences. Um, there are some well-known examples that were uh, gifted to us by the folks who constructed the various models of infinity one categories. And 
we, it's very easy to prove that the synthetic theory of infinity categories, so things like adjunctions and limits and Cartesian vibrations and pointwise con extensions is all preserved, reflected, created by such functors. And very importantly, uh, theorems that are proven in a particular model, but using structure that's not axiomatized in an infinity cosmos, that's sort of outside the purview of the synthetic theory, those theorems can also be uh, translated. So, um, Understanding exactly which statements about infinity categories are model independent is, is a bit subtle um, because, you know, sort of simple statements like this infinity category has one object are uh, not invariant under equivalence between infinity categories even, and so certainly cannot be invariant under change of model. And, um, but uh, this is a, a classical problem, kind of a well known problem in ordinary category theory. And um, Michael Mackay has developed a formal language, uh, he calls it first order logic with dependent sorts. Uh, that is a restriction of ordinary first order logic. So these, this, these are sentences that a computer can recognize as uh, being grammatically well-defined. Um, and uh, his restricted language is suitable for higher dimensional category theory. So because of our ability to reduce these uh, sort of infinite dimensional definitions. So definitions of an adjunction or in a limit, which really do involve infinitely many coherence conditions to this truncated two categorical setting to kind of the classic Australian formal category theory setting. We're able to take uh, Mackay's formal language essentially off the shelf, adapt it to the particular framework for formal category theory that we use, which is something called the virtual equipment of modules, and then prove that any uh, formula or sentence about infinities categories that is written in this folds language uh, of a virtual equipment is invariant under change of model. Now, you might object that I haven't really given you a very uh, explicit description of that formal language. And the reason is its signature is, is quite complicated. So this would be a whole uh, talk in and of itself to really go into the details here. But um, anyway, this is the signature for the folds language for virtual equipment. And, uh, and we'd be happy to uh, talk more about that on another time. So um, there is a summary. So in the past, uh, the theory of infinity categories has been developed analytically in a particular model, but a large part of that theory can be developed simultaneously in many models by working synthetically with infinity categories as objects of an infinity cosmos. Um, we've chosen our axioms in a particular way that are, are kind of quite strict. So they kind of simplify proofs and allow us to work up to isomorphism and so far as possible. Um, in fact, much of our development takes place in this quotient homotopy two category, just using the methods of Australian style formal category theory. And importantly, we're able to prove that these results are invariant under change of model functors. And in, there's a formal language expressing exactly which statements are invariant under uh, change of model functors. So I'll leave you with some references and thanks so much for your time and attention. Well, thanks very much, Emily. I'll sort of applaud on behalf of everyone. <laughs> Um, there's a few questions in the Q&A session. Uh, we've learned that it's easiest if you just read out the question and, and answer it. Not everyone can see the question. So uh, So I'm supposed to read out the questions. Uh, I can do it if you want. Maybe the uh, first one. Uh, were these slides made with Beamer? <laughs> because <laughs> yes, you've got a compliment on the slide. <laughs> So I should thank uh, Pierre Kanye, who's a, a postdoc uh, who I interacted with in something called the Khan Extension Seminar a few years ago. And I've stolen his Beamer template. So in particular, the, the beautiful clock is his design. Okay, uh, next question. Is there any work in infinity categories applied to homotopy type theory? And it's answered by the same uh, person that uh, is an archive highest structures in homotopy type theory. So I guess that's just a comment. But did you want to say anything further about that, Emily? Sure. So uh, another interpretation of the phrase synthetic uh, theory of infinity categories could be synthetic in the sense of a, uh, a type theory where types are interpreted as infinity categories and sort of functions between types are interpreted as functors between infinity categories. So a few years ago, uh, Mike Schulman and I explored a uh, synthetic theory of infinity 
categories from that perspective. So we um, introduce a type theory, which is an extension of ordinary homotopy type theory, which adds uh, simplicial shapes to the context. To the context. So this is kind of similar to the move that's made in cubicle type theory, if that's something you're familiar with. And um, that type theory is intended to have semantics in complete Siegel spaces. So in one of the models for infinity categories I discussed here, not all of them, it's, it's quite hard to um, give an interpretation of a type theory. So we um, getting it into one model is, is uh, hard enough. Um, and uh, we've developed a tiny portion of the theory of infinity categories from that perspective. There are a lot of open questions in that area. So if that's uh, something that interests you, um, please get in touch offline. All right, thank you. So just a reminder to everyone, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A uh, function. Uh, another question. Are the folds sentences all the one invariant on the change of model, or does folds only capture part of them? Great. Uh, so the the um, that's a that's a wonderful question. Thanks for asking. Um, so the the folds work is a relatively new development. Um, we started putting this together just a few months ago, and we're still uh, investigating um, it. So the result we've proven is a preliminary one-way result. So if uh, you're formula is written in the folds language, then it is invariant under change of models, um, not conversely. And um, I'm certain, in fact, the converse is false because the language is really specialized to this kind of truncated two-dimensional categorical structure where we develop the formal category theory of infinity categories as opposed to, to the full infinity cosmos. Now, um, one of the things that we're hoping to work on in the near future um, the intention was with an incoming PhD student at Macquarie, uh, is a uh, folds language for the full virtual equipment, or, or sorry, for the full infinity cosmos, not just for the virtual equipment. And that's something that uh, you would hope would have a two-way result. So Mackay's analogs of these theorems uh, do have the two-way result, but our particular case does not because we work in this kind of truncated formal category theory context. Okay. Um, another question. Thank you for the talk. Uh, it seems that infinity one cats are unified in your new book. How about infinity two categories? Would infinity Cosmo as an infinity two category encounter the problem we had that it is just a particular model of an infinity two category? Great. So, um, so uh, I often describe uh, Kind of what infinity cosmoi are about as a, a proof methodology more than a definition. I think um, you know we we made a lot of choices in choosing our particular definition of an infinity cosmos, and um, they could be changed without uh, changing the theory in some sort of fundamental way. Uh, so I think what's important here is more the sort of synthetic methodology, the idea of axiomatizing the structure on which your infinity categories live as objects than the particular notion of an infinity cosmos. So our particular definition of an infinity cosmos is optimized for developing the theory of infinity one categories. So it, uh, and then the synthetic theory we develop of an injunction between infinity categories, a Cartesian vibration between infinity categories, those definitions interpret to the correct ones in infinity cosmoi whose objects are infinity one categories. Now, um, a lot of models of infinity two categories also define infinity cosmoi. So um, Alex Campbell, who's a, a postdoc at Macquarie University, um, observed that two quasi categories define an infinity cosmos. Uh, theta two spaces also define an infinity cosmos. Two completional sets also define an infinity cosmos. I suspect Siegel two categories do as well, but I don't actually know. So if somebody wants to figure that out, that would be great. Um, so uh, it is um, principle, or it is possible in principle to sort of specialize the results we've proven to give some subset of results about infinity two categories, but it's certainly not a comprehensive development of infinity two category theory. So the sort of adjunctions that we describe between infinity two categories are more like the adjunctions that you would get, uh, are more like the two adjunctions as opposed to, uh, you know, sort of a local adjunction or a weaker notion of adjunction between infinity two categories. Um, what I think somebody should explore and 
maybe this is something we'll try to do, but maybe somebody else will uh, get there first, is uh, a, a new definition of an infinity cosmos that's more optimized for infinity two categories. So I would change the enrichment to something over an infinity one category to over an infinity two category. So this new sort of infinity cosmos is really some sort of infinity three category and uh, go from there. All right, thank you. Um, so a question from Joe. So if I have a theorem in two categorical language about structured one categories, what extra work is needed to upgrade it to a theorem about structured infinity categories via the homotopy two cat of an infinity cosmos? Right. Um, so that, that's a good question. Um, I don't know um, if I'm gonna be able to uh, give a complete answer, but let me say a few things regardless. So uh, if you have a, so your two category of, uh, structured one categories and uh, maybe structure preserving morphisms and um, all natural transformations between them uh, probably is an infinity cosmos. So there are um, two, two categories with uh, pi limits uh, define infinity cosmoi. So, I mean, there's a sense in which uh, your result might be um, understood as a result about a homotopy two category, but kind of in a trivial way. I, I, I know that's not exactly what you meant. Um, I mean, a thing to be careful about in general is whether the homotopy two category is correctly capturing the homotopy coherent notion that you want. So um, one of the things that I asserted in this talk is that the notion of a junction that you define in the homotopy two category, so this is given by the data of a pair of infinity categories, a pair of infinity functors and a unit and co-unit natural transformation satisfying the triangle identities up to pace inequality in the homotopy two category. So uh, Dom and I prove that any such a junction can be extended uh, homotopically uniquely to a homotopy coherent adjunction. So to the full kind of homotopically correct notion of a junction. Um, the way I said it, you have to forget the unit or the co-unit, but there's a homotopical uniqueness sense. So, that, so a theorem like that uh, is behind the scenes justifying the use of the two categorical definition of an adjunction. So this might lead you to think that you could also use the two categorical definition of a monad, you know, a monad being an infinity category and an endofunctor and a unit and multiplication natural transformation satisfying some pacing diagrams, um, but that is not homotopically correct. So um, something about obstructions from extending from uh, A3 spaces to A infinity spaces uh, for a similar reason, uh, the sort of two trunk, the homotopy two category notion of a monad is not a full homotopy coherent monad. Um, so uh, I guess at the level of generality, you asked your question. I don't know if there's anything productive I could say, but um, get in touch and we could talk about it some more. All right, thanks very much, Emily. Um, so I don't see any further questions in the Q&A. So maybe this is a good time to wrap up then. Uh, uh, thanks again. I know it's been a long day for you um, over there uh, for this wonderful talk. I hope you all enjoyed it. And, uh, and look, you uh, look forward to, to the attendance again in early April for the next uh, Matrix online seminar. Thanks again, Emily. Thank you. Thank you.